I've lived a thousand lives. I've pirated a thousand souls. I've killed and fought and died just for another goal. This is the Happy Jacks RPG Podcast, a roundtable discussion that's a mix of friendship, humor, unbridled enthusiasm, and tabletop RPG topics sent in from around the world. Just for another Hello, and welcome to the Happy Jacks RPG Podcast, Season 31, Episode 25. My name is Kimmy. I'm Kadeem. <laughs> and in today's episode, Sean from Washington, D.C. asks about encounters and experience points in games. Jason from California discusses the experience of women in the hobby. And Erica Odd shares about it's what my character would do. If you'd like to contribute a question or story to the show, you can email us at happyjacks at rpg at gmail.com. That's happyjacksrpg at gmail.com. Um, announcements. Season 31 is coming to a close tonight. Tonight is our last episode, and we'll be taking a two-week break, starting Ooh, back yes. with season 32, the first week of May. So, yeah, two-week break. Don't think we stopped. Keep writing emails, because we need them. And we'll be back the first week of May. And just a small break. Just yeah. a little two, two hiatus. Yeah. That's all. It just really like breaks for me to like update stuff in the studio more than anything. Yeah. And uh, you know, see my kid on a Friday night once. <laughs> and then uh yeah, and we'll be back also in May with an indie designer of the month, because we took a break from that from April since we didn't use all of April. So all right. Dave. Nah. Mailbag number one. Number one. I'm number one. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Dearest Happy Jackers, Jack Files, and the Happy Jacks Nation. Today's letter for the advice show is about how PCs can always surprise you and asks your thoughts about fitting into the mold of DMing for another person's game. It's interesting. Yes. I like the, the thought there. I'm going to think while I read. Uh, I'm guessing you're all familiar with Friedrich Nietzsche's phrase, that which does not kill us makes us stronger, yet... Does it make us stronger if not being killed is largely a function of having run away rather than face the challenge? Rather than try to answer that, answer this right away, first some context. I recently had the honor and pleasure of being a guest DM for a D&D 5e game. My first foray back into the D&D fold since 3.5. Yeah, yeah, that's how it worked for me, too. Uh, the overall concept of this game is to have a different, possibly recurring group of DMs that facilitate adventures for a core group of players. If you're wondering how this works out, at the very beginning of the game, the PCs encountered an artifact which caused them to shift across worlds and time. With every jump, they retain their memories, character features, and gear except for the artifact, which they must then find in the new story arc in hopes that the next jump will take them home. All right, all right. Some D&D &D quantum leaping. I like it. <laughs> uh, each DM story arc is a one-shot that takes place between jumps and sandboxed from the other DM's arcs. Although DMs are given the option to communicate and plan with each other. Okay, all right. Then with some production editing magic, a couple of the players take the recorded game and turn it into a podcast. For some shameless promo, search the interwebs for the Adventures from Glenview Mansion podcast. All right. Is there not like a specific URL? You just have to search. It's like part of the game is like the internet, like scavenger Listen, hunt of finding it. It Psychologically, this actually works better. Oh, really? Because oh. people that find things on their own uh -huh. think that they're in on it. Oh. It's actually, unfortunately, one of the ways the QAnon thing is so popular. Oh. Yeah, because that's true. I discovered They this. put out little seeds all over the place and people find it on their own and... Yeah. Then they're in on the whole thing, and they're like, no, oh, look, I found this. Nobody would have wanted you to find that. Oh. They get invested. We we shouldn't talk about that, because I could, that's like my, like, listening to podcasts about that stuff is like one of my hobbies. I've spent so many hours <laughs> diving into the QAnon right? phenomenon as like an academic study and like listening to podcasts about how people get, like, I could do a, I, that next to like, like, Hot Guys and Horses, like, that's going to be my third podcast is some <laughs> sort of weird dive into that. 
Were you here for what that a left turn. What a left <laughs> turn on podcast topics. I like it, though. <laughs> Variety is the point of life. Well, it was from another email in another episode. Oh, there I don't was think like, I was here on that No, no, no. It was like uh, we were talking about horses and one of the APs or something. And I was like, mm. this is a thing I could talk about yes. for a really long yeah, time. Yeah. I was here for, the, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's been a recurring theme. Horses, yeah. Yeah, it's and cool. Hawkeyes, yeah. It's cool. Dangerous. Hawkeyes or horses? Both. Yes. I mean. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Continue. We're way out. Go. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> back at it. Uh, there are a few episodes out as of writing this letter, and the podcast will likely run through at least the summer and possibly longer. Awesome. Uh, I like, I like the concept behind it. Mm -hmm. That sounds fun. Yeah. Uh, I was the third level story arc DM and had never played with anyone in this group. This was fine since I've run plenty of one shots for various groups before. The group was great and we all had a good time. I find one shot gaming with strangers to be the perfect way to be surprised by players and their PCs. Yes. For sure. And this group certainly did just that. Without knowing much in advance about player encounter preferences, I tried to provide a balanced mix of social, mental, and combat challenges. That's tough in a one-shot for D&D. So, props. Uh, <clears throat> the social and mental encounters went well, but the combat encounters blew my mind. Most of the D&D, as well as non-D&D player characters from other games, were more than happy to slay opponents and loot treasure, sometimes to the detriment of my NPCs. Sure. Often to the detriment <laughs> of the NPCs, yes. <laughs> it's just a dangerous world to be in. <laughs> yes. Adventures are coming. Hide! <laughs> but you're the tavern keeper. Still! Still. Lock the doors! <laughs> Don't let him in. Pretend you're not here! <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, occasionally, player characters from other games used a mix of diplomacy and other non-lethal combat options to overcome without killing to resolve combat, typically linking these approaches to role-playing characters' classes, alignment, or backstory. Yeah, for sure. What surprised me about this group was their persistent preference to avoid combat altogether. They always led with social skills and character abilities, such as the Calm Emotion spell, to prevent initiating combat or tried to run away when combat started. I've had individual players in previous games avoid combat encounters, but never an entire group avoid combat, as if it's an allergy. From what I knew of these characters, none were specifically anti-physical combat. Uh, conflict, excuse me. Uh, the party consisted of a chaotic neutral bard, a lawful good barbarian, a chaotic good transmu transmuter wizard, uh, sometimes the group's preferred strategies worked, and sometimes it only delayed the combat from happening. With my guest DM story arc complete, I reached out to the players to learn more about this playstyle preference. One player noted that his character became extremely averse to violence after a traumatic fight in a previous DM story arc, and he thought the strategy would, be, would offer better engagement for podcast listeners. I await feedback from the other two players. Ultimately, while surprising and a good learning experience, this phenomenon was entirely manageable and did not seem to negatively affect anyone's enjoyment. So if everything was peachy keen, why write about it to the advice show? After that potential, uh, potentially superfluous background info, I finally come to the crux of the matter. <clears throat> or the biscuit, as Stork would say. Mmm, biscuits. <laughs> I didn't have dinner yet. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm, biscuits. That's podcast number four. Biscuits. <laughs> biscuits and then like gravy. Yes, biscuits and gravy will be my sure. fourth podcast. Literally my dinner last night. Oh, so good. So good. <laughs> I could eat it for every meal. And two of my three kids were like, F you, Dad. We're not eating this. What? Yeah. I was like, You failed as a father, Dave. I, no, they just make healthy choices. It's probably better. And there's more for me that way. No, I mean, like, one of them was fine with the biscuits as long as she could drown them in honey. Okay, that's a... That's which is also a valid a, way to a eat a biscuit. Choice, yeah. But as a sole choice for dinner, it was a little too much. The other one was like, I'll eat the biscuit, but I want to make it, like, stuffed with butter, like a donut. Okay. She didn't want to split the biscuit. Yeah. She wanted to, like, hollow a little bit and melt a little butter and pour it inside so it was like a... I Jelly donut biscuit butter thing. I I don't hate that either. I yeah, it sounded oh, okay, but yeah. both of them were like the gravy part. You can just go straight to hell. We're not going to eat that anyway. <laughs> let me finish this email. 
<laughs> it's going to be one of those nights for me. Sorry, everybody. It's fine. <clears throat> look of horror on my face for those of you listening to the podcast. Like, turning down the What? Baby? What? <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, <clears throat> where, uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, here we go. Uh, in my usual games, I award experience points to PCs for overcoming any type of encounter. They can overcome combat encounters through lethal, subdual, or nonviolent solutions. I'd like to think I'm rather flexible on what it means to overcome an encounter. However, to me, running away is simply surviving an encounter and not necessarily overcoming it. I may award a smaller amount of experience points for running away from an encounter if the PCs learn something they could use later. So running away has the game mechanical effect of taking longer to earn their next character level. That's fair. I mean... Yeah. I, I would agree with your base statement of running away isn't the same as overcoming an encounter. Mm-hmm. Unless it's running away to find a way around them. Yes. Or to find a different route or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the recent game awarded experience by Milestones. The PCs earn a level automatically when they complete each story, each DM story arc, at least for now at lower levels. In the grand scheme of things, this would be fine since the PCs completed the overall story arc objective. However, it leaves me wondering if the PCs should earn that level regardless, or if they continually avoided rather than overcame multiple encounters before reaching that arc's final objective. Hence my motivating question about getting stronger from that which does not kill us. I feel that having multiple DMs could complicate this issue, but it can be mitigated by having the DMs with adjacent story arcs be on the same page and together manage player expectations. My questions for today's show, crew, are... We have come to the questions. Ah. I made it through that page. Good job. You did great. Uh, this, is a, this is a great email, Sean, in the classic style of having a lot <laughs> of information. Throw back to Whew. classic Happy Jack's emails. Ah. And I'm, I haven't even had beer yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll fix that. Uh, <clears throat> number one. Have you ever had an entire group of PCs use an avoidance strategy toward combat encounters as their default approach for all combat in a game? If yes, how did that go? Do you want to take these one at a time? Yeah, or? let's do that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that, really? Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's it, it's fine. I was. Uh, it's been a long time since I've DM'd, since I've done Dungeons and Dragons, um, and I've only ever done it at like home games. But, uh, so I think it's more common in other systems. For d and it is a lot harder because it's a system based on combat. So while you, sure. can, yeah, while you can avoid combat, that's not what the core mechanics are meant to do. So a lot of the leveling and stuff depends on, like, fighting things. And it's, it's in more recent editions, it's kind of moving away from that, sort of, but it's still really hard to not do it. At its core, it's a combat simulation game. Exactly. With tacked on yes. extra Fancy bits. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, I will admit, absolutely, for Dungeons & Dragons, it is it is hard. And especially as you're if you're jumping in as a DM and you don't expect it, that can be hard. And especially for a one-shot, that can be really hard. Because a lot of run, yeah. r running one shots is uh, anticipating what the group's going to do, or having at least a couple options that you know they'll do. And if you don't have that, and they do a completely different thing, it's good job. Good, good job, like flowing with it. Good, I, I give you total props for that because that can be really hard to do. Um, yeah. So in other systems, it goes great usually. Like that's happened to me when I was running like Savage Worlds. PBTA, it happens all the time. That's part of the kind of design is to have like open options there. Um, so I think system, system, I think, affects that quite a lot. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Nick. Hi. Welcome. Hold on, hold on. We have a surprise, Nick. <laughs> he literally scared me. <laughs> I was like, ah. Okay, so. I'm going to talk about this for a minute while they get their mic sorted out. Yeah. So um, I will tell the story about Clara, who was with me last week. Clara hates, um, like, combats. Um, not as a GM, but as a player often. So she will come up with the weirdest stuff and always jump to 
um, like kind of like uh, both of you scoot that way just a little bit. Um, jump to like social abilities and social mechanics and stuff like that to avoid fights. So it's interesting to play with her and then sometimes with people who are more into fights because then you have kind of that balance between uh, someone who wants to get into a fight and someone who doesn't want to get into a fight. And then that's when you really start having problems is when you've got two people at the table who want separate things from that encounter. I Yeah. I, I mean, especially when you've tried to build a balanced encounter. And yeah. you had, end up having a player character that decides, like, I'm a nope out of this. Uh, and then you have a wildly unbalanced encounter for mm -hmm. the other remaining players. Yeah. Uh, but I've never had a whole group in a D&D &D game try and run. Mm -hmm. I mean... I've had them run. I've, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't not, know. Not, as a, not as a regular choice. Yeah. I've had them run, but usually only after they realize, like, oh... We're in it now. Yeah, yeah. Like gonna, we are so far in the weeds, we need to go. Um, and I think there's an important difference between them handling an encounter through it means other than violence and running away. Like yes, that's two very different things. Like if they yeah. just see a monster and they're like, oh nope, 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 out of this, like leaving, then that's not handling the encounter. I agree, they shouldn't get XP. Right. If they find a way without fighting to handle the situation, I think they deserve the XP. Yeah. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had entire groups that have just noped out of the encounter, and mm -hmm. I just don't mark it down um, for whatever reason. They just decided that, oh no, that's that's too many skeletons, too many bones. <laughs> I'm 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 going away. They're all on the outside. Ah! Not on the inside. I need to leave. I do not want to be boned. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and just leave, and that's fine for an encounter. Mm -hmm. Um. I've also had groups where they try and avoid all combat, and it is a little bit frustrating because it's not that it's not that I just want to like see goblins die when I on you know on my Saturday nights. Sure. Well, okay, maybe a little bit <laughs> sometimes. But but uh, but when you you've gone to work to set something up or they're allegedly heroes, it's hard to be. It's hard to accept that when it's nothing but, oh, uh, let's let's go left. Let's talk about it. Yeah, but if this is about uh, experience, no, I don't think they should get experience if that is they are avoiding it entirely without a plan. Yeah. If if there's a plan to go, oh great, instead of fighting these guys, we're gonna climb up this mountain and we're gonna redirect the river into their camp. Great, yeah. absolutely, you you took care of it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 perfect. Even if that's stage two. Yeah. Right. Like if they're like they get in there and then they run away, make a plan, right. and then get through the problem. Oh shit! There's thirty bandits, <laughs> not four bandits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna. Okay, we'll figure that out. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I I can't say I can't. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had a whole group just nope out without imminent death. Yeah. Uh, I I think that if people are that. So I'm very much, I want to play correctly. I want my character to live. I want to do it right. So sometimes I am frustratingly cautious unless I specifically make a character that is not. And if you have a whole group of people who are like that, that's the, that's the it took them an hour to open the door type of situation. Yeah. Okay. And, let's spend 20 minutes arguing about our marching order down this hallway and... Yeah. Right. And I've got this out and I'm doing this and, and stuff like that. And you kind of need someone to just push open the door. If you have a whole group like that, then whether it's combat or just moving moving the story along, why are we playing if the story is not moving along? It's not fun for most people to sit there and argue about the best way to open a door or yeah. the best way to engage this enemy without taking any damage yourself. Yeah. Well, and specifically, why are you playing D&D? Like, there's a lot of games that you could play if you want to engage in just social mechanics and conquering problems with social mechanics. D&D &D is not designed for that. <laughs> and uh, not to be like, hashtag games about D&D &D or whatever it is. <laughs> but, like, especially when you're sitting down to a D&D &D game, you're kind of agreeing to that social contract of, this is a game where we're going to fight stuff. And it's cool if you want to try other stuff first or things like that, but there's also a little bit of a balance. Like, you don't have to talk to the bandits on the... Like, maybe you should just kick their asses. Just, you know, just do it. Just, I, just do it. 
To be fair, he said in this party there was a bard, so he probably seduced <laughs> everything. Yeah. I mean... That's a go-to move. I've played D&D &D with Joey. I've had that experience of just the, the bard who... Yeah. Yeah. The I mean... Bard. Stork and I asked for it because we made the party of all bards you did. to do an adventure at a con game. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's. Uh, it, well, I also like, I'm amazed that, like, I mean, DD's added stuff. Like, he, he mentions that spell of like calm emotions and stuff yeah. like that. It's like, I don't know, like, you add stuff in. It's like, okay, they, they start to like, starting to murky the waters a little bit. Like, there's all these tools now for you to avoid these combats using things like that. And it's like, I don't know. I, I, I tend to applaud players and groups that try stuff like that first, at least. Yeah. Well, to me, that's not fucking off. That's right. not just no, no, no. Road, I agree. Like, yeah, yeah. That's like okay, cool. We're gonna try and manage this and see if we can right. negotiate our way through or not mm -hmm. freak out the goblins to come murder us or yeah. whatever we're gonna do. Okay, if that's the way you want to get through this, ta da. That's mm -hmm. fine. If if we're sort of merging into point two. Absolutely, sure. people should get experience if they figure out a way to take care of a problem without doing combat. Yeah, here, why don't yeah. we read the, Yeah, we have I'm our actually, Oh, I'm sorry. I have no, no, sorry. No, no. <laughs> it's. I thought yeah. I wasn't sure. Where no, we're no, no. We, also, we were like, let's let's pause after each one and discuss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I also love that you were like in the chat and saw there's an empty seat, so you like drove over here. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> you saw the chat. And then you left and said, like, oh, okay, he's busy. Okay. And then it's like, yay, surprise, Nick. <laughs> And legitimately, my reaction of like, oh, someone's here. <laughs> like, oh, God. Yeah. I was wondering if you're going to be like, who the fuck is opening the door? But the door was still open. Yeah, so no. I just walked right in. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. We're still frantically prepping for Lorland's party. So people have been in and out the doors uh, like, constantly. Gotcha. But he, suddenly he gets this look on his face. And I'm like, that's not the look of like <laughs> my husband walking in. Like, what is no, happening? No, no. <laughs> Well, and like I immediately was like, oh, it's Nick. But then I was still like, someone, <laughs> people, <laughs> unplanned, unplanned. <laughs> all right, point two. Okay, all right. Question here we go. two. Question, Question two. number two. What are your thoughts on awarding experience to PCs that run away from an encounter, and would that response differ based on the type of encounter? I would give extra experience to somebody that just straight runs away from a social encounter. <laughs> Because that would crack me up. Like, oh, I believe you must meet Lord Henderson, the, the manor keeper, and see if you can impress him. No! And, like, <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> that would, that would, like, if somebody legitimately did that and just knocked me off guard like that, I would give a Benny in, sure. in a Savage World. Or, or I would give uh, uh, inspiration in D&D &D 5th? Yeah. 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 Uh, just to be like, all right, cool. So now the Lord doesn't like you, thinks you're a real weirdo, but okay. Uh, I mean, again, I think we have to like specify between running away and like handling it in a non-violent fashion. I think that, I think that's an yeah. important thing. And and here's the thing. I think specifically his game setup is such that. You kind of have to, yeah, because you're you're doing this. It's like they're doing like a rotating GM thing, okay. And like each GM does a one shot that represents like a milestone one level, yeah, okay, for the characters. And then they kind of do this round robin through a bunch of GMs, and uh, you know the the conceit is it's sort of like a quantum leap situation. Like they find this artifact, it jumped them into a new universe. They have to do something to find the artifact to try and get home. Gotcha. And it takes them to the next and to the next. It's like, okay. Yeah, it's a cool idea. Yeah. Um, so since you're in that situation with the you're not there all you're not there their forever GM, it's sort of set up to be like uh you have to kind of uh go with that. You know, set up and be like, okay, well, all right, you passed my mission. Here you go. That kind of a deal. In that setup, though, what happens if the group doesn't want to engage? Like, if they do, if they do run away from the challenges and they don't find the the. I mean, I feel like that. Yeah. In this in this case, that breaks the conceit of the game, and you've essentially said, "I don't want to play the game that I agreed to to play anymore." Yeah, I mean, well, if the like the players have to have buy-in too, right? Like if they just yeah. are like, well, "Fuck you, we're not playing this game anymore." I feel then... like yeah, especially if they're like they, they like they're making this podcast, I feel like the 
the players have agreed to this. Yeah, so they're yeah. probably, I feel like they're like with good faith trying to find the thing. So it's like everybody kind of works it out like in a one shot. You kind of wiggle and move things around until it's like, oh, we have a good ending. At least you try to do that. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. But... Yeah, yeah. Well, ba based on the question, though, if they run away from the encounter and this is basically milestone, then the point of experience goes away entirely. Yeah. Like, did they solve the problem and get the artifact so that they could jump to the next GM? Yes. Then they then they deserve their milestone and do it. Mm -hmm. If they don't do that, then they don't. And someone needs to figure out how they're going to have the next GM take over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> Let's do number three. Three. Number three. Uh, were you ever a GM in a similar type of game? Not West Marches that cobbled together a campaign from one shots with the same players and multiple non-player GMs, whether those GMs had to coordinate their content or not. If yes, what was that experience like? What advice would you give for people planning to play or run those type of games? Uh, I'll just finish it. Yeah. Cheers. Sean from just outside Washington, D.C. Are you Jedi on Discord? I feel like that's like a trick question, right? <laughs> are you Jedi? Are like, you Jedi? Are you? No. Are you he's Jedi? Dead. Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. Um, uh, P.S. Drink a tasty beverage of choice. The last. Uh, um, P.P.S. Pretend you're all co-DMing the next story arc. Mm -hmm. Each of you contribute one element of the arc, such as setting, location, party's mission, t type of encounter, a BBEG detail, a secret, a MacGuffin, and so on. That's like a whole other email question yeah. thing. <laughs> we can not go off on that at the end. All, like, okay, P.P.S. Let's just play Decima. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to do what the email says. Yeah, we have it's to like, oh, get the deck out. <laughs> uh, so, my only experience with a similar type of situation was I did actually do the what the hell was it called? Um, the early uh, D and D third edition RPG group. The you know, they had the it, like like the, the like, organized play. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the Adventures League. Adventures League for it, that it, type. It was it was still Adventures League. It's been Adventures League for a long time. It was something else. Uh, RPGA. Yeah, that was uh, it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Digging back in the the yeah. deep old times. Yes, yes, that's why I couldn't <laughs> find it anymore. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. So I I kind of did that for a little while at the local gaming store. Um. And that you're kind of encouraged to do a very similar kind of thing, where here's your thing, run it, get them to point X for the next thing. Um, well, didn't you co-GM something? I've co-GM'd often. Which was, but but not, not like, like I know you've done it where you were working together, but didn't you do one where you were... You did some, and then someone else did some. You've done that with Stu a couple times, and you've done that with Stork yeah. at cons a couple times. Yeah, but not like it, it's Stork's turn to GM, yeah. and then the next game I come in and GM, and then no, con yeah, it you was guys always a together. United say, yeah, Stu and I we did it a little differently. Like it was like cool. You figure out the Palladium combat system, Dave, and I'll <laughs> do all the story stuff. And I was like, cool, all right, all right. great, thank you. That seems like a fair no. <laughs> it's a different levels of time commitment, but yeah. we worked together and came together with fine. Um, yeah, I've never, I've never done something quite like this. Like I've done co GMing too, but never like passing a group of players off in a completely separate story. I've now I've written adventures for different things. Like I wrote some stuff for Hunter's Entertainment um, for their Kids on Brooms, like Friday free content. And that was sort of the thing. It's like we each had like part of an adventure, like a larger overarching story to write. So that was a similar experience, except mm. I didn't actually run it. Like I had to help design it so that it was part of like a la larger through line, even though mine was like one smaller like sub adventure. Um, so that was sort of similar. And we did have to have a lot of meetings kind of ahead of time to make sure things were kind of lining up as far as like difficulty and how things would happen. And it, Oh, what if they do this instead? So they, but those were pretty free form and it was more like guidelines and actual rules for people who were running the game. It, I think it would be, well, I, I mean, I'm actually, I'm really excited to go check whatever this show is out. Cause I'm fascinated by how that would work out. Like just like 
like sight unseen handing like a group of players into you like you know they've yeah. been playing here's and, basic information i have no idea what they're like or what their campaign is like in any way that's a that's a brave thing to take on <laughs> early in my uh early in my gaming career when i was a teenager the a group of us decided we wanted to do something where we were going to hand it off and we decided we were going to play something that was dimension hopping like mm -hmm. that i think it was torg probably oh, yeah. back in the day um, and we all agreed to it and it was great. And after the first person did their like two or three sessions, the next person refused to do it. And I being a brand new neophyte was like, I don't want, like I was way down on the list because <laughs> yeah. I was like, let me, let me learn how to do this. Uh, let me see how everyone else's thing goes so I can yeah. you know, make, make the cliff notes version. <laughs> uh, so it didn't go anywhere, but mm -hmm. like I've always thought it would be a neat idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And, in the it is, like what you're saying, it does sound like sort of similar to what happens with, you know, Adventurers League and stuff like that, where yeah. every time you go to events, you like are the next part of the story. And it's like you have no idea what your DM is going to be like in those things. Um, I mean, sometimes you do like you're in a smaller community. But right. sometimes I go to like Strategicon and there's like you go in a room and there's like 30 tables, everyone, of you know, everyone participating in Adventurers League. And you're just like, wow, it's like. I don't know, like roulette, <laughs> like like DM roulette. Okay, do I get do I get the one I want? Okay, and then I don't know. It's interesting. Well, if not, then uh, oh my oh. SNO just called. I gotta, gotta go. go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I left my house on fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's it's fascinating though. I'm sort of I sort of want to like I don't know maybe for like our next uh, like like Rainbow Railroad or something, like do some sort of thing like that where it's like, although then you have to have the same players for all 24 hours. That's kind of exhausting. That's a lot. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's like, I don't know. It gets great around. <laughs> super wild, yeah. <laughs> around hour 20. Yeah. That's a hell of a game. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the thing we could do in that kind of a situation would be, you know, okay, you do like a four hour stint here and then you come back, mm -hmm. you know, take a, take a, 12 hour break, come back and do another four hours. Yeah. Kind yeah. of a thing. Like you or, can do three, four hour games. Mm -hmm. Or you have the same characters, but different oh, players. Oh, and pass them along. Sure. That'd be interesting. And so everyone hops in, pilots that, that character for four hours, and then moves to, and then gets out, and the mm -hmm. next person comes in and does their stint. Yeah. And you could tell like a story that was kind of disjointed because the GMs are going to have a different vision of what that's like, and the players are going to be a little bit different. Yeah. But that might be a fun way to do Super it. Super fun, yeah. yeah or fun. just get a get a bunch of us together and do it for for a show. The show, just do it. It'll be. I mean, that would be super fun too. I, I, I don't want to take like their content yeah, yeah, idea yeah. though. I mean, maybe in a little while once everybody forgets we read this email. No, sure. <laughs> but I do think like we do, we do a lot of like co GMing. A lot of us do that, especially like cons and stuff. Um, but it, I still feel like that's a very different experience. Because you've got that, like, yeah, when I co-GM'd, um, I've done it with Frey, I've done it with Bill, I've done it with a bunch of people. But when I GM'd Savage Worlds with uh, with Bill at a con, decade, I don't know when, it, forever ago, a long time ago. And we would, like when the party split up, we'd each take them to different tables. And then, so we had no idea what the other person was doing and we'd just go for it. And then... Like, we kind of shout across the room, hey, they're coming now. And then, like, we'd all come back together when they got into the same place. So that was sort of similar. But it was also, like, we were right there. So, like, I ran over at one point and just asked him something and, like, double-checked that we were, like, still kind of in parallel, you know, instead of perpendicular, like, <laughs> screwing things up. You know what I mean? There was that game, and I'm struggling to remember. It was... Uh sort of a whole game event, multiple tables. They were all playing simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And you could pop between tables. Oh, that's cool. And, like, they were all <laughs> in different parts of a multi-dimensional thing, and the story oh. was coming together. That's amazing. Was it Laughing Moon? Was oh, yeah, them? the Laughing Moon, yes. The so, that... yeah, like, he, he... I think he still does it. Like, I think I think it's, like, a whole system now, because it started off as, like, a D&D, &D, like... And, like, well, like, a, a novel he was writing, and then it became a board game, I think, or something, and or, like, a D&D &D supplement. And then he came up with his own mechanics for it. Yeah. But, yeah, he would run it at cons, and I think we even did, like, a show with them, a live stream at one point with them, but um, where, like, yeah, like... 
he and a couple of different GMs were all running it at like these huge like tables. And they were usually in like not a circle exactly, but like kind Yeah, of it was like, like in a big yeah, like thing. thing. And yeah, that was that would be interesting. That's yeah. Yeah. That was hard though, because I, I played a couple games with them and it was just like it would be like someone like picking up one ring and trying to jump in and like play in Tolkien's word world when like you didn't know anything. And like less helpful gems than me who explain everything about no but i just remember coming and like sitting at the table and it was like 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 you needed to know the entire history of that world for some stuff to make sense and i was like cool got cliff notes got got anything got no no okay we're just gonna go with it okay so i don't know the only thing i would be concerned about this and maybe this was addressed earlier is hard feelings between sessions yeah. Like, if you think you got a bad call and now it's your turn to GM, do you – how how do you make sure that people aren't then being – you know, even if not overtly vindictive, mm-hmm. but just, like, make the calls against the person that they feel slighted by? Yeah. In, in this particular situation, the mm-hmm. players are always the players. Okay. It's like a rotating cast of GMs. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I it's see. not like – Oh, yeah. Remember when you told me I couldn't do this? Well, fuck yeah. you today, buddy. <laughs> yeah. But in normal, like, that's what I've seen, like, groups that, like, rotate, like, GMs, and that can be a problem, oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But for this, I feel like I'd be like, oh, fucking never seen that person again. So. Yeah. <laughs> Peace out. That's kind of great, yeah. actually. Yeah, it's, just, it's just different GMs get on every bus stop. <laughs> oh, man. And then they just ding the little bell and disappear into the night. I wonder if it's like a, like a, I don't know, like a reality show where at the end they do like a uh, like a council and they just like all like talk about the the GM and like or the DM and like, oh, you are kicked off the island. You don't get to come back. <laughs> I've always thought it'd be fun to do some kind of a like GMing game show. Like, yeah. <laughs> kind of a thing where like your players have to rate you on cards. And GM you, Island. Yeah. yeah. Kind of a thing. We've talked like, about it a couple times. We have like a couple iterations of it like in our heads and we just, I don't know. I feel like it would it's complicated and it might get real bad. Yeah, like, it would real get messy. Really, bad. yeah, super messy. Oh, all right. Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Okay. Sure. Yeah, bye. Oh. No. Uh I would point you to places I used to love in Washington DC being a longtime resident. However, uh, a different gaming friend recently moved there and I tried to look up all the places I used to go and they're all gone. Aww. So I went through a list. I was like, "Oh, what about that diner? Parking lot." Oh, well, what about that bar? Fucking gone. Oh, well, what about this place? No. What about the place you went on a date with your wife for the first time? No, destroyed. Oh, just, just somebody scorched earth my whole life there. Oh. So enjoy the city. It's a wonderful place. For like two weeks between uh, <laughs> like summer and fall and then two weeks from like winter into spring when the cherry blossoms bloom. <laughs> Absolutely fabulous. The rest of the time, outside can go fuck itself. <laughs> All Dave's life will fall away like tears in rain. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I literally, dude, literally, I had the thought of like, Am I a replicant? <laughs> Were all of those memories implanted and they're not actually real places? You've been reading way Holy too fuck. much of of that that game. Like... No, that was years. That was way months before I even picked up that game to oh. read. Yeah, <laughs> it was totally just a thing in my head. Like I remember a lot of these. Like I even went and talked to my wife. I was like, "You remember that diner, right?" And she's like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Well, it's a park right now." And she's oh, like, "Okay, okay, <laughs> all right." <laughs> Just worried why you're so stressed out about the parking lot. <laughs> she was like, are you okay? Aw. All right, mailbag number two. Jackers of happiness. I would like to broach the subject of women in gaming with particular discussion of specific areas of all the realities uh, that women face in the hobby. I'm old enough that I didn't see women in games except for girlfriends of uh, of whom a few played and of those who actually played, almost none actually paid attention. Okay. The first serious female gamer, I, woman gamer that I met was my future wife. This overall topic is primarily aimed at women because we are half, they are half of the human population. But in most cases below, you can swap out many other un, underrepresented groups. Uh, personally, 
I've had a long journey from a kid who stared too much at any woman to the ridiculous kid who is uh, gifting and casting spells on women's characters to be a heroic savior. Uh, then to the guy who treated them neutrally, and finally to a person who is surrounded by women in games. In recent years, I participated in a group in Sacramento, California, set up specifically to provide comfortable spaces for women in play, uh, to play TP TTRPGs at a game store. Topic in the first. Discuss the experience and point of view of a woman who is interested in gaming. I don't, I don't know if I can do that. Um, presumption is she has few or no friends in the hobby, and thus must go to a game store, a convention, or somehow break into a local group, mainly with strangers, as doing such with friends in itself is a separate challenge. Introducing friends to a niche hobby, uh, the niche hobby of RPGs. How should she approach this without being too cautious and thereby avoiding or losing the opportunity? All right, well, I guess this is me. Um, she should not be too like she should be too cautious. She should continue to be cautious. She should not stop being cautious at any point. Um, it is safer to uh, avoid losing the opportunity than to not be safe with her person. So sorry for the the buzzkill of that, but yes, um, this is one of the things that's interesting because a lot of people like there is the the kind of like trope of the girlfriend gamer. But a lot of times, especially like in yesteryear, when many of us got started in the hobby, having a boyfriend or significant other who was in the hobby was your only safe avenue to joining the hobby. So a lot of us started as like the girlfriend who was interested and so like tagged along. Um, and, and so that trope exists for a reason. And it's not always because we wanted to impress the boyfriend, although it was always a nice thing. But... Um, but partially also because it's like, hey, this is something I'm sort of interested in doing, but it's not safe for me to go to a gaming store. It feels weird. People don't treat me well there. Um, it's not safe for me to just like pull this person's phone number off the like board, you know, looking for game gamers, go to someone's random house, stuff like that. Oh, my lumbago. <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly aged yeah. 600 <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> we all shriveled up. We all became like that, like woman from Titanic. Give. Yeah. It's been eighty-four years. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that, that used to be a thing. Yeah, it used to be a thing. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't something that was ever really safe for most people to do, but especially a lot of times women. Um, so I, I don't know. I think now there are there are more options like you said there are gaming stores that are specifically like creating events for marginalized groups um there are conventions that are specifically reaching out and targeting those also like big bag con does an amazing job of having sponsorships for people of color and lgbtq and a lot of different um other groups and i think that is providing a safe way for people to enter the hobby that normally would have to kind of, I mean, it, it's a gauntlet of like going to a gaming store, maybe being treated bad, asking to join a group, maybe being treated bad for not knowing all the rules or because you're new at it. Or, or maybe being treated bad just even if you do know all those things because Because of the group beards. you're in. Yeah, exactly. Because the group you're in and it's like, oh, do you want to be the caster, honey? Oh, we really need a healer. You must be the healer. Yeah. It's like, okay. Uh, so, I, I don't know. I think, um, kind of going back, uh, approaching it with caution is is vital <laughs> for everyone because it's it's not a safe world. And um, But I, I, one way to do it now is like there's a lot of online places that you can start playing games online, which is safe because you can always be like, nope, I'm noping out of this. Turn off my computer. Goodbye. And um, so I do that. There's a lot of places on Discord, like tabbyjacks.org slash Discord. We have a lot of games that are playing. Um, but that's a, a safe thing. Looking for um, spaces that are run by women. There's a lot of different places now. Like there are women-owned, you know, friendly local gaming stores. There are online spaces that are owned by women that are specifically designed to, like, keep it safe and keep, you know, and, and be inclusive. Things like that are very low bar looking at local conventions and ask like call, like reaching out to them saying hey do you have anything in place for you know new people who are interested in getting into the hobby a lot of times they have like specific games set up for new players or they have welcoming rooms where you can come and like 
and and start getting into the hobby without all the pressure of just signing up for a random game. Um, a lot of conventions have um, like like things set up where they have like a specific place where you can meet up with other people who are similar, like if, of your marginalized group, so that you can like go together, kind of in in enforce together. So you're not like the only one at the table, which is always like very uncomfortable. Um, so just finding out, finding things like that is really, really important and can completely change, change the game. All right. I think I gave a lot of advice and it's a lot of me talking. So part two. Well, I mean, oh, good. it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, the logical <laughs> reason why you spoke on this topic. For sure. Yeah. Um, but I don't, like, like I don't know. I think I got everything. Like you, you both have been to like conventions enough to you've seen like a lot of the cool stuff that are that's starting to be there to scaffold and try and yeah. help new people enter yeah. the hobby. I mean, back in the back in the day, not as far back as the bulletin board and the pulling tags off, I used to see meetup groups that were like that mm-hmm. that were yeah. specifically designed to show people the 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 game or the hobby without being. Yes, it was still meeting random people, but it was set up in such a way that it seemed like it would be more supportive towards than just being like, hi, I want to join your game. And oh. the, the problems with that would. I, I have seen one situation where some people tried to set up like a welcome to the hobby mm-hmm. kind of a thing, and it came off badly. That, that, that does the, happen. It turned it into like a forced timeshare presentation about oh. gaming like they did a whole powerpoint thing and did a whole like oh <laughs> okay hey, this hobby it can be so much fun and here's some examples of things that might happen here's and, the corporate introduction to this thing that's really fun yeah. we promise listen i can get you into this barbarian right now but i need you to sign this contract for me <laughs> i was like okay because I, I peeked at it digitally and i was like this is not this is not going to sell anybody on doing this. Yeah. Like, cool. Yeah. Um, Alvaro in the chat also just brought up, like, a lot of the times that stuff is really geared towards D&D and Pathfinder, too, which yeah. is absolutely true. Um, there was kind of a explosion of women uh, entering the hobby when White Wolf got super big because, like, the kind of vampire genre has, you know, was was very popular and it was something that suddenly people were suddenly women were more interested in. They felt they had more access to because there's more exam at least at the time, there were more examples of like powerful women in that type of genre where like high fantasy, not so much at that right. point. So uh so I think that too, just like having having options there where people can play something that interests them and that that they they feel um, connection with, too. Because not everyone wants to just play high fantasy stuff. All right. I agree. Yes. That's me. Yes. <laughs> I know this person. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> and yet, every Monday, you show up for my highest of high fantasy. I disagree. Yeah. It, okay. It's not. We are just a village fantasy. You are. <laughs> on the road. Like... <laughs> It's true. We walk past high fantasy stuff happening. Yes. But we don't want any of that. We're just... If you look to your left, you will see Rivendell. <laughs> Rivendell was established by Lord Elrond after the... And if you look to Bye. the... Yeah. Now, if you look on your left, coming up on your... Or coming up on your right, this is the road to the Shire. We will be stopping in Bree for our free drinks at the Prancing Pony at the end of the tour. This is like our example... Yeah, yeah. I, I tweeted today. I was like, so if you want an actual play that's like curling up in a fuzzy friendship blanket with a hot tea, hot cup of like Tolkien lore tea, like, you know, on a rainy day, like this, yeah. this is the this is the, the, the AP for you. It's just like like chill vibes. Like, that's what and as we come out of Rivendell's territory, if you look left, you can see the back of Rivendell. <laughs> a very specific Disneyland, <laughs> Disneyland joke for those of you. <laughs> the backside of water. All right. Uh, I lost my spot in the email. So uh, We're just under the uh, second. Topic last the second. Paragraph. Topic, oh, topic the second, yes. Discuss the experience and point of view of a man who is interested in playing with running for women. He doesn't want to come off like a creeper. Hey, ladies, want to role play? But wants to be an ally. How would women want to be approached or take to or advertised at to get the right vibe? Include a sub-discussion of 
I love how it's like specifically like this is what you get for to get a four on this <laughs> essay. You <laughs> might think specifically. This is one hundred percent writing for one of the AI chatbots. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> which I'm delighted. Yeah, include a sub discussion of a group of guys that are approached without them having pre thought about this. Oh, okay. So like. How do you pre-think about like including women and and other marginalized groups at your table as I'm assuming like a cis cis white guy and then include how you talk about how you handle that when they just like join your game and you haven't had time to play. Um here I'll just finish off the email since oh. it's really close. Both these are equally applicable at conventions. When a person sees a group at a con when uh with the space at the table, what would each side's perspective be for either approaching the table or making their table look more approachable? Jason from California. Uh, uh, I feel like both of you can speak to that a little bit. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just gathering myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh so my first piece of advice uh is they're people. Treat them like people, and you tend to find friends among them. <laughs> yeah, when you're not like, ooh, the strange gazelle is approaching yeah, right. the table. Yeah, yeah. Don't oh. lick your lips when they sit down. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just, just oh, guys, guys, be cool, be cool, be right. cool. I think she's interested in playing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't don't <laughs> leer over your DM screen like, mm hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, just uh. Be cool, man. Just... <laughs> well, and don't so so. I'm not sure how you get someone to feel more comfortable approaching you. That's kind of on them. I mean, you can do things like don't have your players be talking about their bitches, or you know, <laughs> or about going to yeah. a you know, going to go to a whorehouse, like. But that's applicable for sort of anything. Like, if you want to do that in your home game because you guys think that's funny or you folks think that's funny, cool, I guess. But, like, especially in public, if you want people to be joining you, try and be approachable and the kind of people that... that try and be the kind of people that you would want to see if yeah. you were approaching the game. Yeah. You know, not have... I don't know, not, not have too many in-jokes to make a person feel not wanted, not be, not do anything like creepy, like make an assumption about what sort of class they're going to want to play or, mm -hmm. or, I mean, certainly don't try and force any sort of a romantic relationship on anyone. Ooh, yeah. Um, just cause no one, no one wants that out of the blue mm -hmm. or, or treat someone differently. I mean, this is kind of in a, anyone who's new to the hobby specifically don't, treat them like shit because they don't know the rules because this might be the first game they've ever decided they interest them enough to want to play. But especially if you're dealing with someone who's who's traditionally marginalized, marginalized, like just be cognizant of that. Treat people like like people. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't know exactly how to be <laughs> well, <there laughs> better are, than that. Yeah, there are some things you can do. Um, one thing when I walk up to a table and it's a GM I've never played with before, like looking at the pregens, like making sure there's a good variety of genders or that like I can make the genders whatever I want. That makes me feel more like welcome at the table. Um, if, when I walk up to a table and it's all pre-made and it's all dudes, I'm like, cool. Or like there's one, there's one woman. And it's like, well, now I feel like I have to take that character, even if it's not a class or build or whatever that I'm interested in. And then, because then everyone, like, if you don't take that, like, all the dudes who show up for that spot, like, then, like, just look at you. Like, well, don't you want to play this character? It's like, no. I, <laughs> I, I very clearly was here first, and I didn't take that one, clearly. Um, so that's a big thing. Having some sort of safety tools on the table, even just walking by, if I see an X card, I'm much more likely to be like, okay, that's a, that's a oh, table that's I want to play good, at. That's a good point. Yeah, just having it there where I can see it. Um, well, yeah. I mean, that's a good thing for people that are already in the hobby. Yes. Because, I mean, from the, like a brand new person that's like, I'm going to go to a convention and play in a game. I don't know great. what that strange X is on the middle of the <laughs> like, table. What does that mean? It, it's just part of this game, I guess. What, is, you that, know? is that the rating, like a movie rating? This is, <laughs> oh, this is I don't want to X game. Table. I don't want to be here. Yeah. Uh, I feel like this question is more generic. Like, this one isn't just about the brand new. Like, it's like someone who wants yeah. to be an ally. Yeah. So, like, yeah, you're right. Um, I think also having some sort of, 
a lot of cons, like when you have the sign-up sheet, there's like a little description of the game on there and stuff. Like specifically putting like the the rating of it is actually something that I, I look for and I try and include that there. Like, mm -hmm. hey, this is, you know, and uh, Strategicon does this by de like default. There's like an age range that you have to put in when you're submitting a game to run it. So like having information there, um, listing if there's safety tools on there, things sure. like that, and saying, hey, welcome for new players. You know, you know, if you've never played that system, that's okay. I'll, you know, we'll help you through it. That's all stuff that's great to have on that sign up too, so people like know that when they show up. Um, and I think, I think if you really want to be an ally, like, like I mean, it, it it might seem a little forced, but like saying that everyone's welcome at the table, like in your little blurb, that can go a long way. Like just see, like when I'm sitting there looking and like, okay, what games have you know, opening saying everyone's welcome. Okay, like that's that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Or if it's not, let's say it's at a game store or something and there's not a, a mm -hmm. written description, just if someone seems interested and maybe, because probably they're going to kind of observe for a little while, mm -hmm. just be friendly, be like, hey, did you want to sit down or, you know, we can make you a character real quick. Mm -hmm. I went to a, I actually went to a DD and d game yesterday and there were four brand new people and uh me and a friend who were very well versed in it sat down and helped two of them make characters right there and like walk them through the whole process because we want more people to be involved in the hobby yeah so like don't assume a don't assume that they know nothing yeah b don't be afraid to share your knowledge or to be helpful or just like helpful you know friendly in general mm -hmm. It it absolutely makes a big deal. I've I've been in situations where I'm watching a game in progress and just like, oh, just watch, it's fine. And people invited me into the game and and like made me feel welcome and explained like, oh, how does this work? Cool. And didn't look down on me for that. Yeah. yeah. Start by asking questions. Um it still happens to me sometimes. It doesn't as much as it used to, but like it still happens to me where I'm at a convention and people like, Oh, do you do you like role playing games? Yes. Yes, I do. Like, it's like that. Is, is that what this is? This is yeah. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it's but, valid. No, okay, like, but I, I said it wrong. Like, they say, they, they were like, oh, like, like, just the way they say it, it's like, yeah, I mean, when you ask it. Yeah, I mean, slide into condescension. Yeah, but, it's yeah. there. And a lot of times, or like, uh, oh, have you played role playing games before? And it's like, yes. I mean, I, I literally, like, to, to get over that, I started projecting, like, but, like, wearing shirts that had, like, things and like my my pin jacket that has a whole bunch of like rpg stuff on it because it was just easier than like having that conversation every time i went to like a sales booth or sat down for a new game but there's like yeah just don't have that you know condescension because it's like even people who are new to the system you might be running might know a fuck ton more than you do about other stuff i'm not saying i know more than everybody but it's like i know a lot and i it, it still bugs me every time and it just puts me on like edge when there's like that assumption that I, just, oh, you're so, you're so, you, do you know things about this? Do you, it's so, we would like to have you in our hobby. And you're like, cool, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna write an email and I'm gonna eviscerate you on the internet. And <laughs> you will never know. But uh, yeah, I, I, so like, like asking questions, but from like a point of actual, like, hey, are you interested in this? You know, Hey, are you interested in playing Savage World? Hey, are you interested? Like, that's a way to to phrase it because it's like, that's not a some that's not assuming that the person doesn't know anything. That's assuming, hey, are you interested in playing this? Not, hey, do you know about this thing that I'm talking about? Um, there's a there's a big difference there. We're we're playing a game you probably haven't heard of, but uh... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that's a valid point for most of the games I show up with. That's true. <laughs> But, but but couching it that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and also like, I picked a weird game. You may never have heard of it. Is different than oh, I know. Reading's hard. So have I you know read? you know Dungeons and Dragons yeah. because that's the big thing right now. But this is Savage World. Yeah. And there's more dice. Uh, there's not really answer, but <laughs> I just I want to do that now with the weird ass games I end up running with Rob. Yeah. <laughs> like oh. Do you know a lot about Dallas, the role playing game? <laughs> Come sit at our table. Oh my God. I That would sell me like 100%. Um, yeah. And uh, also just be like giving people space. Like mm -hmm. if someone's just, just hanging out and watching, they're obviously interested. 
they obviously don't want to necessarily be put on the spot. So sometimes, like, instead of, like, calling out to them for a crossroom, hey, do you want to play? You know, which is... Don't don't pressure them also. Yeah, like, if they're like, no, I'm cool watching you. Okay, great. You know, have fun. And, like, if you have any questions, let me know. I was, I was going to say, one of the things you absolutely should do as a GM at a public space is before your game starts, keep your head on a swivel, right? Like, look around, see the people, like... People that are interested, but maybe they're being a little nervous about joining. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna shark walk by the table a few times, you know, <laughs> and and you kind of keep your eye, and then and, you know, on the second pass, maybe you're like, hey, you know, I've got an extra spot if you'd like to try. Yeah, um, or if you're interested, or whatever. Yeah, just just 100%. go go for it. Yeah, like it never hurts to be like another trick I found as a dude is wearing subtly nerdy shit. Yeah. <laughs> it reels in folks uh, because they're like, yeah, all right, that guy's wearing a labyrinth shirt. Yeah. Right? Like, cool. All right. David Bowie makes me feel safe. <laughs> and other things. <laughs> I'm going to go sit down at that table. Oh, that's what that feeling <laughs> is called, is safe? Okay. <laughs> that's what the kids are calling it these days. <laughs> but. Yeah, I'm 100%. And like, it it counters the advice I just gave about don't don't pressure people. But I did enough like hawking at fair for years of like come see my show. Hey you, come come right now. And like like I sort of GM that way sometimes if I got yes. empty, if, empty spots in my game. Hey, hey or or you, even if you don't, even if I don't, even that's how I end up with nine people at a table. Hey, you're sitting here. You want to join us? No, it's totally fine. I only have eight players. It's totally cool. I've got ten character sheets. It's fine. Come on over here. Um, it usually works, <laughs> but. Uh, to to be aware of if you are in a like to address the you know if you're you're with a group of dudes at the at the game, mm -hmm. remember that you were that it was your first game at some point too, yeah. And not to you know ev everyone was new at some point, so treat them like you would have wanted to be introduced to the game. You know, make mm -hmm. it make it friendly and welcoming without being weird about it. <laughs> I feel like we're circling back to a lot of, I don't know what weird behavior would be, but I'll know it if I see it. I can't I describe mean, it to you. I mean, I could sit, I could write an, an essay. Like I could write a doctor, like a, a doc, my, what do they call it? A dissertation about like creepy behavior at gaming conventions. But uh, it, I mean, intent is a lot of it. And, uh, and, and that's a hard thing to like, police yourself on like just know like read do your best because i know it's hard for a lot of people like read the body language if they are pulling away and shaking their head and not engaging like abort abort leave it alone uh another thing if you're playing in a public space mm -hmm. and you're wanting to encourage new people to join the mm -hmm. hobby and your table in particular try not to fill up your table with your friends Mm -hmm. And only have like one empty spot. Yeah, that's uh, a lot. Because then people are going to walk by and they're going to see you engaged with your friends in your friendship banter. Yes. Before a game. And that's intimidating because you guys are automatically going to have inside jokes. You're automatically going to have things you're talking about that they don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. It's going to make them wander off. Like leave a couple of empty seats if you can. And then people are more likely... Because I've also seen a lot of cases where it's two friends come together. Mm -hmm. Or even more. Like, sometimes it's a group of three or four friends that are all like, do you have room for us in your game? And you're like, uh, <laughs> I'm not really ready to have... I'm not. We're not all Kimmy. We're not all ready for 10 <laughs> players. So, like, uh, yeah, okay, here. Can the two of you maybe play one character together? Like... <laughs> After 36 fourth graders, like nine semi adults is not a big deal. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, I am going to like, like push back a little bit on that. If you're running an event at a friendly local gaming store or something for a specific marginalized group, seed some people in there. Like if you're well, like, not, like, not, not like tons of friends, but like if you're going, if you're, you're, you know, trying to have um, like a, LGBTQ event where it's like bringing people into the hobby, like have people who identify as that, who are familiar with gaming already, come and help because it's much 
it's much less um, intimidating to come and sit at a table with people that you can kind of identify with. And then you can kind of, you know, if they have questions, they can ask them if they're more comfortable, um, that you're also much more like uh, less likely to get things happening in the game that will like upset them or 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 kind of cross their lines because the other people at the table, while it's not universal, will have some similar experiences and probably be more attuned to what they might be upset by. It also, it's kind of like having a TA. Exactly. Someone who you can kind of depend on to to smooth over or explain things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I, I specifically don't. I don't mean like no one you know should sit at your table. I All mean it more strangers. like like if you're gonna have one or two at a six person table, yeah. great. That's fine. That's that's awesome. Even especially if you can play it off that one of them is a super ringer for your game, and you don't let on that you know them. Uh, you can do all kinds of fun stuff with that. Um, but yeah, having having a group of people that looks like they're ready to have fun, yeah, can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, like just chill vibe, like not too high pressure. And honestly, one of my favorite things about this hobby is playing with new people. Yeah. Because the the things they come up with are just wild sometimes yeah. and absolutely a delight. And it's so much fun to try and introduce things to new folks and yeah. get them interested and, and have a good time. Yeah. So. And, and let them experience it too. Don't don't tell them how they should play their character. Don't oh, yeah. Don't uh yeah. <laughs> Like I was just thinking how, if you, how horrible that is. If you've got a new person at the table, you become their yes and best friend. Yeah. And let them do let them do weird things. Even if it's like maybe not exactly how that spell's supposed to work, like give them a little grace because like the the, the fastest way to run someone out of the hobby is like, oh no, you can't no, uh uh. Like within the rules, but like also don't don't be the person who's like, oh, you know, like you should really cast this spell right now while we're in combat. The yeah. Fucking like the fucking worst. Like hate it, hate it. If somebody asks for advice, yeah, that's that's different. That's fine. Like, but yeah. no. Yeah. You did not invite a new person to the hobby so you could play an extra character. Yeah, and it, it's they are not learning, like by you, you, you know you learn by doing, not from like the asshole next to you like peeking on your sheet and like giving you notes like that is not how you fucking learn yeah the the guy who was helping last night made a wizard and rather than saying like oh take these spells my thing was okay what kind of wizard do you want to play do you want to someone who blasts things great these are some good options for you read through them and we'll pick out some spells yeah uh, like if you have any questions i'll tell you what that spell does yeah. or you just read it do the thing yeah well and as a gm that's a little different like you're like Oh, I was just oh, a player. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, like like helping them and like giving them options. It's like the the person who like it, it, like line reads your moves. Like, oh no no, you you should go over here on the board. Oh, no no, don't go that way. She doesn't want to do that. She wants to do this. And you're just like, I want to stab you with a pencil. Is what I want to do. That's <laughs> really what I want to do right now. <laughs> Sorry. Like, had that happen a couple times. It's very frustrating. All right. Yes. In short. Don't be a dick. All right, mailbag number three. Should I read mailbag number three? Yes. Did you two read these ahead of time, or should I no. keep it? Okay. Oh, and this one's from Erica. I know that. Oh, okay. Yay. Savage Worlds. <laughs> you just pick that out of your brain. Yeah. Foreshadowing. I, I, I don't know why. That I just, uh, <laughs> for some reason. Yes. Hello, happy folks. It's the bane of GMs and players alike. For as long as there have been RPGs, a player picks the worst possible thing to do and peeps up with, but that's what my character would do. Yeah, and my character... I'm already mad. <laughs> <laughs> and my character would slap yours senseless for that boneheaded move. But is it always a bad thing? Not necessarily, at least in Savage Worlds. Sometimes what your character would do gets you a reward in the form of a Benny. I am in a game on alternate Fridays on Roll20. It is a magical post-apocalypse setting, our world, but years in the future after the end of modern society and magic has returned. That old chestnut. One of the characters is basically a Pinocchio type, a construct with the very young hindrance, oh. essentially making him the equivalent of 8 to 11 years old. 
He has a driving urge to find his father, lost to him he knows not how. He asks every friendly NPC how to find his papa, oh. and if they will have and if they have seen him or will help him, etc. He's pretty single-minded about it, understandably, as it's his father. Anyway, we were tapped into a magical virtual reality. Think the Matrix, but magical. I'm trying to find information on the location of a notorious bandit camp. Guess who got the font of information first? Right, our little robot lost. We get one question. Guess what he asks? <laughs> yes, it's what his character would do. He got a Benny as the font of information faded away and the ping wraiths, ghost-like security programs, closed in on us and we had to have a running fight to get back to the portal to escape. Their leader was the Witch King of Admin. Yeah, I'm not the only IT pro in the group. <laughs> That's delightful. Ping Wraith is delightful. It is, yeah. yeah. And the Witch King of Admin is yeah. also very, mm -hmm. very nice. Super good. Chef's kiss. So now he knows where to find his father, and we have promised to help him over the uh, and we have promised to help him over the past few sessions, but now we're back to square one on finding the bandit camp. Even though it was a it's what my character would do situation. We all got a good laugh about it and a few, oh no, when we realized <laughs> that it was that character who got to our destination first. It's what my character would do isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes it can make for a memorable session. Signed, Erica Odd. P.S. Don't drink, but have a taco. Taco. I actually had tacos for dinner. I'm um, going to go have a taco after the, after the show. I want a taco, yes. Uh, that is actually a really great... I love that. I love that that like that and that makes perfect sense. There's been like foreshadowing and like the fact that like when that question came up and like the other players are like, oh no, that means like it's a well earned. That's what my character would do. It means that like they've been like laying that foundation. They shockingly m built a character yeah. that exists in the world and is and three dimensional motivation. enough to, to have shown their motivation and want to do things. So the other players at the table are like, yeah, that's what your character would do. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. That is the excellent way to do it. Yes. For sure. The out of left field, I'm just going to murder some dude. Yeah. People or. I'm going to steal everyone's stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm playing a rogue. And so in the night while you're sleeping, I stole your teeth. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. That, that's the stuff that's always like, or if it's like constantly like like this doesn't feel like like working against the other players like this is part of the story and it, it, it this is like clearly the moment that like everyone knew this was going to happen it's when it's like oh like every single time you get somewhere oh i'm gonna like rob somebody or it's just like every and, single or, time or, or if this person hadn't been doing that the whole time yeah that would be super like if somewhere out of left field they're like how do i get the treasure of you know, Kalamazoo. Yeah. And everyone's like, what the fuck? What is that? We're, we're trying to find this bandit camp. Yeah. Well, secretly, I've been an agent of blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right. Oh, God. That's, that's the trick, is if your character choices are working with the story, mm -hmm. you're doing it right. Yes. When your character choices are actively making the story worse for everybody else, yeah. that's the problem. Yes, yes. Like... like Every time you get to safety, like then they have they they always do a thing to like make it so it's not safe anymore. So you get like no downtime in the campaign. That's like exhausting and sometimes doesn't make sense. And then like like there's so many different examples like that that just are so well. It's what my character would do. Cool. Why? Well, why? Yeah. So make a different character. Yeah. Why did you make <laughs> that character for this particular game? Like, why? Well, I feel like it falls into the conversation we had about consequences yeah. and punishment in the game. Yeah. Uh, Natural consequences. For, for that sort of stuff. Yeah, like, if everybody keeps getting, like, consequences because you keep doing the thing, like, why? Stop it. Sorry, that's all I've got to say about that. I've yeah. In a rage and frustration. But I love this. Yes. So much. Yeah. I just, I love it. And it's like that you can just picture it in your head, like, even not being in the campaign, like... Where's my, where's my dad? And everyone's just like, oh, and their character's and like, like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if the players love it and the characters are horrified, that means you're doing things right. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, 
we're all here to play a game together. Yes. Right? Like, don't be that person that yeah. is like, guess what? I'm going to shit on all of you because I think it's funny. Yeah. What, what the right. Hell? Yeah. What, right. Yeah. Like, different, different venue, but in MMOs, I hated people who would, like, their fun is just killing me while I'm trying to go quest. Oh. Uh. Like yeah. your your fun is at my expense. That's not okay. Yeah. And it's same in a in a role playing game. If you're playing with people, if your fun is happening at everyone else's expense, well, then don't do that. Yeah. Or get out of that group. Or find a bunch of other dickheads who all want to sort of dick each other over and have yourself a whole little circle jerk party. Yeah. But like leave leave the rest of us who want to have a good time alone. Out of it. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's not fun for them because it's only fun if they're the oh, only. Oh, that's true. Yeah. The, it's only fun if they're the only one doing it. Because when people do it to them, they get fucking pissed off. Why did you do that? Well, that's what my character would do. Well, that's a dick move. And you're yeah. like, yeah, my sorry. my lawful good paladin turned you into the yeah, <laughs> knocked you out and turned you into the to the local cops. Yeah. Well, why? Yeah. It's what my character, character would do. do. <laughs> Oh, see, now I want to do the, like, that's a punishment people deserve. Yes. Like, I, I restate, like, all my stuff from previous episodes that you should go listen to if you haven't heard. I mean, <laughs> I, in our One Ring game, there's been things that I've done that are what my character would do, for yeah. sure. Things that left turn the whole freaking game, like, I'm going to cut open this pearl. Yeah. Like, but... It was a natural thing. A hundred percent. Like, there's a thing in a... You get a pearl the size of a basketball, and there, you know there's something in it, like... A mysterious thing that... Anybody, yeah. everybody would cut that up. Like, nobody was like, why would you do that? You have, like, like the the stone singers of, of the Dwarven Kingdom, like, oh, the, there's a stone inside this pearl. It's like, well, no... Like, yeah, come on. It was put there for a reason by the yeah. GM, like, for I mean, sure. by... But you know, the whatever, the things in the story. The random rolls of fate that yeah, left exactly. this to be eaten by an angel. Totally fish. random. Yeah, I feel like that's like playing with the story, just like this is, yeah. this moment was, yeah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can do things that are sort of selfish for your character that are also perfect and amazing and make the story so much more interesting and so much more deep. Because this moment is that, like Erica was describing, like, think how, like, when... And if he actually does eventually find his dad, like, that just puts so much more weight on that moment. Because, like, this moment of, like, he had one question. And the thing his heart desired more than anything was the answer to that question. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you finally get to that point in the story, suddenly it's, like, so much more weighty. It's It means so much more. It's a much richer moment because of all the little moments before it. Also, on the outside of the character level, on the meta level, this that story is going to live forever. Every group is going to be like, oh, this one time, yeah. there I was. <laughs> yeah. He, he made it. Oh, yeah. Eric is in the chat room. She says, the yeah. campaign is wrapped, and he did find his father. Yay! Yay. Yeah, because like, I like caught my breath a little bit. That's still like kind of close to my line. Like The, the child <laughs> looking for their lost parent is a little bit like, I know my kid's three now, but it still hits really deep. Sure, and sure. it's just like... Oh, but this, I'm glad that. And it, yeah, I, I'm sure when he found his dad, like, it was just like, oh, like, so meaningful. Like, yeah, so good. All right. Oh, very good. Thank you for sharing that story. That was a very good story. What a great email to end on, too. I know. So good. All right. It's nice when we walk out of here feeling nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. I've like, a not, lot of that lately. Not just like, oh, my Ajita. <laughs> <laughs> Job well done. <laughs> All done. Um, so, thank you for joining us for season 31, episode 25, the actual last episode of the season. We're taking a two week break. And as the chat room corrected me earlier, we're coming back the second week of May because calendars are hard. Um, and please support our amazing. Oh, we don't have that. Uh, please support our. Uh, Patreon, if you want to, we you keep us ad free and independent. So go to happyjacks.org slash Patreon. We don't take ad revenue. We don't take sponsorships. We only sus are sustained by our amazing Patreon. So we can play what we want, say what we want, do what we want. Um, please, uh, thank you so much to our chat mod, James V. And everyone who's in the chat tonight, thank you so much. Um, if you want to help out another way, if you want to help our community grow, you can join our Discord at happyjacks.org slash Discord. We actually have two uh, gaming days coming up. May 20th, we're having our next game days 
spelled D-A-Z-E, because we think we're funny. And uh, JackerCon is July 21st through 23rd. So that's our yearly fan run, like, online gaming convention. Woo! Yeah, and honestly, there's, like, a whole big, like, gaming culture popping up in the Discord. So there's games, like, a lot. So if you are interested in playing games... Go to the Discord. It's awesome. Um, and also, smash the subscribe button, leave a review, interact with the video that you're watching. Any of those things, likes, comments, all help other people find us. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this has been an amazing season, and I'm looking forward to season 32. And my name is Kimmy. I'm Kadeem. I'm Nick. Uh, and we will leave you with a song as soon as I put it in the thing. So, thank you all very much, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.